Content warning. The story of Stonewall involves police violence, and that's a tough topic any day, but it's an especially sensitive one at the time I'm shooting this video in America in 2021. There won't be any visual depictions of it, but we will be talking about things like physical harm, abuse of power, and corruption. I'll give a heads up when it's getting near. If hearing about that is going to upset you, you might want to skip this video. On another note, I'll be using the word queer in its positive, reclaimed sense. Content-wise, this material is probably most appropriate for young adults and older. When I first started this project, I thought I knew a fair amount about Stonewall. Not everything, of course, but I'm a pretty big nerd and I spend a lot of time down internet rabbit holes. I've read a lot of articles, books, watch a lot of videos and interviews. What I didn't expect was just how rich and disgusting this topic could be. Anytime I discovered something new I was excited to share with you, I would dig a little further and a whole new string of stories and details would pop into focus. And I say it's disgusting because the more I dug, the more Stonewall started to sound like something out of a true crime podcast. I kept asking myself, how did we get here? How did things get so bad that it came to this point? So I actually trashed my original script for this video and narrow down the scope of my topic. Today, I'm not going to talk about the riots themselves, because plenty of ink has already been spilled about them by much smarter people. I'll put links to some of my favorites in the description below, and I'll include a mix of writing, audio, and video so you can dig into the formats that suit you best. What I am going to talk about in this video is what was happening in New York City in the 1950s and 60s that made a riot like Stonewall inevitable. Because from where I'm sitting in 2021, some of that America looks familiar, but honestly, some of it looks like a sort of bizarro world where I can't believe certain things were treated as normal. And now, 52 years later, Stonewall is kind of turning into this legend or myth. People who weren't there kind of vaguely know it's important, but we're losing track of the details. And that's where some of the richest, weirdest history is. So let's look at three of the wildest factors that led to the Stonewall Riots of 1969. First, let's look at the Stonewall Inn itself. At the time, the language people used was a bit different, and folks used the word gay to refer to all the different kinds of people in our community, whereas we now would say something like LGBTQIA+, or gender and sexual minority, or queer. So Stonewall was called a gay bar, but a place that catered to lesbians would have been called a gay bar back then too. In Stonewall's case, their patrons did happen to be mostly gay men, but we know other folks in our community, such as lesbians, trans folks, and drag performers went there too. When we call it a bar, you're probably envisioning something like a modern bar with taps and lots of bottles and colored lights and speakers and stuff. It wasn't like that though. It was a dive bar with tons of health code violations. The bartenders were jerks to the patrons. You'll learn more about why in a little bit. In addition to acting homophobic, they watered down their liquor and then overcharged for it. And they ran out of drinks all the time because they never kept a lot of bottles around in case the police raided them. They didn't have a sound system or anything, just a jukebox. Stonewall didn't even have running water behind the bar. Finished with your drink, they dunk your dirty glass in a tub of gross water and then use it for the next person's drink. This poor sanitation eventually led to an outbreak of hepatitis among patrons. When one of these buckets of water got too gross, the bartender would take it to the bathroom and dump it down the toilet, which was more than the pipes could handle. So later in the night, the plumbing would back up and leak sewage all over the floor. Sounds like a hard place to love, right? So why on earth would people keep going back there? As far as I can tell, it boiled down to one thing. Dancing. The Stonewall Inn was the only gay bar in New York City where same-sex couples could dance together. Think about that for a second. New York City, the city that never sleeps. Think about how huge and busy and packed that city is. 
And this was the only place where you could dance. In order to fully understand why that was such a big deal to our community, you also need to know a bit about the laws at the time and how they were enforced. The cops and the laws were unfair to LGBTQ plus folks. It's a matter of historical fact that the New York City cops of the 50s and 60s were downright abusive to queer folks. It was upsetting for me to learn the details. It's frustrating and traumatizing when the people who are supposed to protect us hurt us instead. Whatever your feelings are about police brutality and abuse of power in 2021, its presence in the Stonewall story is simply not up for debate. Even the New York Police Department admits it. Two years ago, in 2019, on the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, NYPD's commissioner, James O'Neill, spoke about police conduct during the riots, saying, the actions taken by the NYPD were wrong, plain and simple. He went on to say, and I quote, the actions and the laws were discriminatory and oppressive, and for that, I apologize. It was an unexpected breath of fresh air to hear the NYPD take responsibility like that. What laws was Commissioner O'Neill referring to, though? I looked into it more and discovered just how cruel and unusual some of these laws were. I'm about to discuss police violence and abuse of power in detail, so skip ahead if that material might be upsetting. In the 1950s and 60s, New York City essentially tried to legislate and police LGBTQ people out of existence. Back then, gay bars were really the only reliable way to meet other people like you, but NYC had made them illegal. There was an entire police unit dedicated to raiding spaces like gay bars so they could ticket and arrest queer people for doing queer stuff. They were called the Public Moral Squad. Great name, guys. So, for example, dancing with someone of the same sex was illegal. It was also illegal to wear a different gender's clothes in public. It didn't matter if you were trans or cross-dressing or what. You couldn't, like, wear a dress if you were assigned male at birth. Not only that, but the law said you had to be wearing a certain number of articles of clothing that matched your birth sex. Some accounts say it was three, some say five. Either way, the cops would count them. They stripped you right there in public, which is utterly humiliating. It gets worse. We know from firsthand accounts that as they arrested you on one of these very unfair charges, they would often beat you, or grope you if you were a lady, or both. They went out of their way to make the experience degrading and dehumanizing. Perhaps worst of all, the cops were accepting bribes from the owners of the Stonewall Inn and other gay bars in the area. It was known as Gayola, which is a play on the word payola, as in a payoff to look the other way. Remember how I mentioned that gay bars were illegal in New York City? The only way the owners of the Stonewall were able to keep the doors open was by bribing the cops not to shut them down for good. The exact size of the bribe differs depending on who you ask, but many people agree that Stonewall was paying high-ranking corrupt cops at least $1,200 a month to stay open. When you adjust for inflation, $1,200 in 1969 is worth about $8,800 in 2021, roughly seven times more. 8800 was a bit of an odd amount of money for me to imagine, so I looked up some statistics to get a sense of what you can do with that much money. I found that nowadays, that's probably enough to pay for a family of three's groceries for an entire year. And these guys were paying that amount every month. And that brings me to my third and final topic. When I say these guys were paying the cops, or when I talk about the owners of the Stonewall Inn, who were they exactly? They weren't just some random businessmen. It was the Mafia, Italian organized crime. 
if you've ever watched some of the mobster films, like The Godfather or Goodfellas, that's who we're talking about. In fact, both of those movies take place a decade or two before the Stonewall Riots of 1969. And in a way, they kind of set the scene. Because although you don't hear much about the Mafia nowadays, back then they were operating out in the open. And everyone in New York City knew it. So why would Italian mobsters, who were generally pretty homophobic, want to own and operate a gay bar? This was the question that led me to some of the weirdest and most shocking discoveries in my research. Remember how I said earlier that there was some true crime podcast type stuff in this story? Well, this is where I uncovered the worst of it. It turns out the Stonewall Inn was a machine designed to prey upon queer people at every level of society. And it made millions of dollars doing so. When it comes to the poorest and most vulnerable people, like homeless youth and runaways, the owners were involved in human trafficking. I'm not going into detail about that since I'm trying to keep this video PG-13. Suffice it to say, it was horrible. The books I mentioned below have more on this if you're curious. We've already touched upon how you'd get exploited if you actually had a couple bucks to rub together. If you went to Stonewall for your night out, you'd constantly be pressured into buying expensive, watered-down, gross liquor, which came exclusively from mafia suppliers and bootleggers. They knew you'd keep coming back to dance there, so they made sure to squeeze every buck out of you they could. But by far, the biggest money maker for the mafia is the one that people have heard the least about. Because Stonewall was the center of a nationwide blackmail and extortion ring. This extortion scheme specifically targeted gay guys who were wealthy or powerful. Let's say you're a guy who works in banking, and you come to Stonewall, and at some point in conversation, you mention what your job is. If one of the employees hears this, they rat you out to the mobsters, who then steal your wallet. They take your personal info and research you. If they were reasonably sure they could squeeze you, they would threaten to out you unless you paid them. And at that time, being outed as gay would ruin your career, cost you things like your professional credentials and insurance, on top of the awful things that we still deal with nowadays, like ruining your family. I'm greatly oversimplifying things, but the extortion ring eventually grew nationwide. They were even blackmailing famous people, Navy admirals, congressmen, rock stars. Some of them were household names. When investigators discovered and began tracking down these mobsters, it was a giant scandal in national headlines. In fact, According to the police officer who orchestrated the raid on Stonewall that actually led to the riots, the cops weren't there that night to do one of their regular searches. They were there because they'd investigated some of this extortion ring's financial activity, and their detective work led them to Stonewall. Wouldn't that be ironic if the one night they were actually there to take down the mobsters instead of us, they accidentally spark a revolution? I told you this was weird. So I can't stress enough that the Mafia had specific ways to exploit everyone who came through Stonewall's doors, from the poor and homeless to the rich and famous. They were there to harm us, not to serve us. So if you imagine being queer at that time, and you have all this pressure from the Mafia on the one side, and from these unjust laws and corrupt cops on the other, well, is it any surprise that something had to snap? I think now you have a pretty good understanding of the bizarro world people experienced leading up to the riots. So I'll paint one last scene for you. All of the things we've covered, the bar itself, the laws and corrupt cops, the mobsters, they sometimes weave together in unexpected ways. For example, the police still had to raid the Stonewall Inn every now and then to keep up the appearance of enforcing the law. So, in exchange for that bribe we talked about, the gayola, sometimes the cops would tip off the bar owners before they came to raid. When that happened, all the mobsters would disappear. They would take all the money and the liquor they could carry out of the place. 
That way, there was little or nothing left for the police to seize in the raid, and Stonewall could usually reopen for business the next night. When the doorman actually saw the cops coming, he would use a special switch to turn on the lights in the bar, which were usually really dim. And that's like the bat signal. It tells the same-sex couples to stop dancing together, to act like they're not together. Of course, there was still no guarantee you wouldn't get arrested or singled out and harassed by the police. But at least you had a chance to get away with it. So in this weird, backwards way, all this corruption and exploitation sometimes ended up protecting the folks at Stonewall and giving them this extraordinary place where they could dance and be themselves and feel human. That doesn't mean that this whole big thing was okay. That doesn't mean that this, all this that we've talked about today, was a good system. It just means that there were some strange blessings mixed in with all the bad stuff. But don't you think, knowing what we know now, that it might have been easier and safer for everyone? That it could have been better for the queers and the cops and New York City as a whole if it had just been legal for us to be us? <laughs>